computer. All right, here we go. All right, hello everybody and welcome. So thank you for joining us today. So my name is Dr. Nicole Truesdell. I'm a writer, scholar, teacher, facilitator. And for this conversation, and more importantly, I'm a longtime research associate with Black Southwest Network, also known as BSWN, based out in Bristol, England. And BSWN is also the organization that's sponsoring this conversation today. And so today I'll be your host for this kind of intimate conversation on ideas of race and racism, climate, justice, land, and community, and what it is in a can and what can be possible for our futures if we accept where we are so that we can imagine where we actually could be as humans, right? So now why are we actually even talking about this right now? Um, in the aftermath of the COP26, which is the United Nations uh, Climate Change Conference that just happened up in Glasgow this past October, BSWN wants to get more into the heart of the relationship between climate change and racism, right? And that's because as a race-based equality organization, we are always examining the various ways racism and its cousin of race impact all aspects of our lives, right? From the negative and violent ways racism acts on BAME people globally, to also highlighting and building upon the ways BAME communities have also made and make our space and place anyway in this violence, right? So with the crisis we all find ourselves in with this global pandemic that keeps having more iterations every week <laughs> to massive environmental um, disasters, to sociopolitical and economic upheavals, the issue of climate, environment, land and resources is more pressing than ever. And we have to actually get to some really basic questions to ask and answer, like who has access to natural resources, right? How is that access actually acquired? What does it mean to actually have your basic needs met now? And in this moment, right, when nation states like the UK and the US, where I'm from, if you haven't realized that, right, have made it clear to many of us of its citizens that we are on our own, we gotta figure it out. And not just figure out how to survive, but also how to care for ourselves, one another. But how do we do that care and not reproduce the same oppressive systems that got us here to begin with, right? So to help us understand what all this means in this moment, um, and to help us think about new possibilities of what these futures can be, I'm talking today to Black British feminist, critic, and writer Janine Francois. Am I saying your last name, Francois, uh, correct? Yeah, that's right. Uh, all right, so Janine's pronouns are they, them, there, and they are known for their insightful, critical, but piercing perspectives on race and social justice. So Janine's um, practices um, deconstructs whiteness and race within cultural and academic institutions by way of writing, curating, producing, research, teaching, and consultancy. Now, Janine's career began as a youth arts manager and educator, and since then, they have partnered with various cultural institutions in the UK to deliver high-impact youth-led creative projects. Now, currently, Janine is um, twofold. She is a course leader for the undergraduate course, VA Cultural Criticism and Curation at Central St. Martin's, and has also set up the University of the Arts London's first ever hip hop culturals module. And Janine is also getting her PhD. She's a PhD candidate, right, at the University of Bedfordshire Tate, where they are exploring if Tate can be a safer space to discuss issues of race and cultural differences within a teaching and learning context. And Janine's research is set to complete in October of 2022. So good luck with all that, Janine. So thank you for joining us today, Janine. I really appreciate your time and care for being here. Thank you. Yeah, I'm um, sorry. I'm putting everything on. Do not disturb. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. So as you're doing, <laughs> listen, we, we get it, right? <laughs> We're in a Zoom world, but the world We are. <laughs> and so, you know... This does not respond to any of your questions, but it's actually a practicality thing. So I've updated my new iOS on my iPhone and it's changed the visual layout. And I can't even, I don't even remember or understand how to put my phone on like, do not disturb. So I'm gonna be very mindful. Sorry to people no, listening. No worries. If, you get, <laughs> if you hear pings and stuff, it's because I haven't even figured out the new iOS update. But um, yeah, thank you for a really, really warm and um, introduction. Yeah, I think there's many things that I'd love to respond to about the possibilities of where things can be and where things can be moving forward to. Um, one of the things that 
I'm interested in kind of opening up and to problematize is the idea we're running out of time um because I find that I want it's really unhelpful and actually quite a disempowering um rhetoric and discourse to have and I think it's actually a form of like dominant culture and dominant ideas um designed to paralyze us to make us believe that we don't have enough time and we can't do something or we can't reclaim um our time back quoting auntie maxine here but like um i just think it's a, a weird rhetoric of capitalism to suggest that time is infinite and that there's a you know set resource of time if you max it out there's nothing that can be done um and i think it i think i want us to think about um indigenous ways of thinking of time being cyclical of time being non-linear that time maps and collapses and falls into each other and if we kind of understand think about time in much more richer and complex ways we can then think about what are the different ways in which we're working now that actually means we still have time we have there's enough time there's time doesn't you don't max out time <laughs> like you don't lose out on time you, you know it's not like oh I've just, all this time is gone and I can't do you know like I find that really um really really um just yeah paralyzing discourse that i think just ideas of capitalism reproduces and i think it makes i think this narrative of we're running out of time i think is actually designed to stop activism or to stop um action taking place to remedy our wrongs i also think it's designed to avoid accountability because not when we talk about climate injustice and you know we think about language like quote unquote the Anthropocene and human activity and human impact and it's like but which humans are doing this because it's not all the humans right it's not everybody <laughs> and they also like to challenge the idea of like the we because I'm like who is this we because this we ain't me okay you know and this we ain't a collective of people who look similarly or like me it's a certain we <laughs> is responsible for this and so I am I froze didn't I for a minute yeah you froze for a minute okay yeah. I think I'm, I'm hopefully I'm back I just I was just saying I find these vocabulary vocabulary is really problematic but it, again it seeks to like flatten things out and create false sense of neutrality and make it looks like everybody's on equal footing so when we're using we and we're flattening out like why corporate western um, organizations and bodies as being disproportionately responsible for climate um the climate impact that we have now then the we of you and i is nowhere parallel for the, the we of how they are literally destroying the planet or the we of like the u.s military that we know uh, emits more ca than carbon emissions than like about over 92 countries um added up together how is my how is the we Par, you know, parallel and on equal footing to the US military industrial complex. So I really, you know, when we talk about this, we are responsible, we are doing this. No, we are not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, yeah, I just really want to like, kind of, yeah, I'm really interested in pushing back on this language and whether it's the we, this false collectiveness of the we or the idea that we're running out of time, which I think we're not <laughs> actually, we're not running out of time. So that's a great way to open this up because you hit on so much stuff that we can really pull mm -hmm. apart, right? And because this idea of the we, like, and that's a great idea of who is the we, who is mm -hmm. doing this. And it's always interesting when the we, we can collapse everybody in, but when we want to get intricate and get nuanced, then there's no we, it's always separate. Mm -hmm. And it's like exactly. having us, yeah. right? So let's, let's, let's get into this mm -hmm. because when we talk about climate change itself, right, before we can even get into who's doing mm -hmm. it, there's a lot of misinformation out there, right? So first we had the term, terminology of global warming, right? When I was younger, global warming and in the US, that was a big thing with the, our, our ex-vice president, right, <laughs> coming in and doing all this. But then that narrative, again, the we get shifted and the blames always shifted away from, we never know who the blame is, right? So therefore, mm. it's nebulous. Yes. And then because it's nebulous, right, then we're all involved, but then there's no one involved. So let's pull it apart, Janine. So how would you describe to somebody who is like, but I'm really confused about what even is climate change? What is the issue? Mm. What is it? And then how would you, and then if, if for me or somebody coming up to you, they're like, well, then why should I care though? Because is it really impacting me? So how, let's start there so we can pull apart this idea of time and who the we is. Yeah, I think that's a really, really great place to start. So I do have questions like that. People do be like, 
<laughs> what's really good so i actually like to always frame that we're presented with climate change as a really contemporary phenomena but i always like to push back and say actually this has been about 500 and 600 years in the making and that we can think about climate change or climate injustice as the advent of european colonization and the kind of um, expanding and conquering and colonizing of territories in quote unquote the new world aka the americas um, Africa and Asia, and that this timeline that started back in the 1500s has created the reality in which all of us across the planet are now dealing with. So I give two very um, clear and evident examples that during um, the conquering of the Americas, um, the amount of indigenous people that was killed and the amount of um, animals and um, that was killed lowered the earth's temperature like that was the biggest impact that's the first time you saw an actual quote unquote climate change that happened in the late 1500s early 1600s so if we can chart climate change as far back as to this particular period in time then everything that we see taking place now is actually a consequence of unfortunately white western white supremacist european colonization and then if we think about other moments in history and we can then go into quote unquote fortress Europe and think about the advancements of technology and the quote unquote industrial revolution where we actually see in places like where I live London a change in air quality which still we have to live with to this day so activities that took place in the 1700s has a direct legacy to the air quality that I breathe in today that's how long and that's how impactful these kind of man-made human activities have lasted for so there are particular parts of London due to the industrial revolution where the air quality because of the constant kind of um, pumping out of um, fumes and using fossil fuels um, as part of the kind of like powering of particular um, machinery has shifted that like, I'm not a scientist, but like the molecules, like the air molecules still stay with us. So somewhere like Tower Hamlets, which is in the East End of London, um, which has for time memorial has been quite an impoverished part of London, where there was a lot of boom and activity around the industrial revolution, still has poor air quality till this day. And the people that live in that area are predominantly brown Muslim people, people particularly of um, Bangladeshi origin, right? So when we then have to think about this area, whether you were a brown person or a white working class person or someone of whatever background who may experience some form of like marginalization has for generations, decades, centuries, breathed a different air to someone who might live in a much more affluent part of the borough, say somewhere like Kensington, by, by, by spare, um, I wouldn't say fortune, but due to circumstances of one's class or ethnicity, means you have a different air quality. And that has started in this particular moment of over 200, 300 years ago, and we still live with it now. So whenever, like, I use these examples because I think people think, oh, it's just this thing that happened a couple of de decades ago. It's like, no, it's actually constant and continuous human activity that has kind of staggered and built up. And then we're literally living with these legacies of things that happened so many you know, decades or centuries ago, but we're living with them now. And unfortunately, the people who live with these legacies are marginalized people, whether it's by way of gender, by way of ethnicity or race, or by way of class, or by geographical location. And these are the people who have to deal with the impact of this human activity um, that started nearly over um, 500 years ago. So um, I think it's really important. This is where the time thing is really important because then by connecting activities of the past to our current and we realize that time isn't this supposed linear progress, right? Because the idea, according to Western ideas of modernity, that things move forward and as they move forward, they get better and better and better. Well, clearly that isn't true because if things moving forward and things get better and better and better, we wouldn't have the same conditions of really poor air quality of Victorian Britain yeah. to a supposed advanced modern 21st century Britain. Um, so those are the ways of how I like to kind of open up the conversations so that people can really understand that history, we still live with it, it isn't this past phenomenon, it's part of our everyday lives. So you have touched on a lot of things that I really want to pull but out. Yeah, I, I get kind of like, 
<laughs> no, but this is great because time, because you, 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 you're really talking and telling us about how time is both a construct that is made, mm. but also a construct that can be remade, right? If mm. we really understand how it's being used kind of against us, right? So, and I love this because what you're showing us is the power of history as a discipline that has been used to discipline us to believing that we are the problem, right? Versus mm -hmm. so you, what you did was give us a whole different history that let us know that a 500 years ago, that past, that past directly is impacting where we are now. But how we understand that past, right? How, when we're hearing you correct, Janine, if we understand that past is not just some past of these great legacy people who came and discovered things and made progress. And so we're here now. And the here now, we should be focusing more on the progress of our technologies, right? If we look at that past, what I'm hearing you saying and seeing that that was the beginning of a, catalytic, a cataclysmic event mm. that completely altered everything we know about land and life and self, right? If we see that lens, that time from then and think about now, whoa, look and think about how much that completely shifts what we can think mm. about success, right? What we think about is as 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 good as as like as what even what human is, right? What mm. is what do we actually value? And so it seems like what you're saying with time, with climate change, is that until we value time as something that truly is infinite, not finite, mm. as something that is constantly generating itself, right? And we have a, a play in that because we've seen the negative play of humans, right? A certain set of humans, right? Coming here, there's a lot possible. But then I got people, who, so you've talked about that well, but then people be like, yeah, but, but that's still, we still have made progress, right? When we, when we want to bring in race, right? When we want to bring mm -hmm. in the con concept of race into this, people love to say, yeah, but yeah, but, yeah, but, right? <laughs> it's not race. It's really about CO2 admissions, right? It's not race. <laughs> it's really about, you know, maybe they blame a billionaire, right? How do you then get people to understand that race is intimately tied mm. to even how 500, 600 years ago, people took it upon themselves to think they could be so destructive to environment, mm. right? How do you- what Yeah, you that's a really, really good question to think about. So I like to ask people when I when I when I push you back, is it just a coincidence? <laughs> is it just a coincidence <laughs> that if you look a particular kind of way, you happen to live in a you just by virtue, is it just, you know, we just oh let's go move to this part of area, or is it by design? And is it by design of both implicit and explicit things? So I use um tower hamlets and poor air quality, but I say. Is it just a coincidence that if you happen to be a non-white person living below a particular line of income, you just happen to live in Tower Hamlets where we know it just happens to be slightly cheaper by way of rent and it just happens to have different forms of access to transport and it just happens to have more likely to have social housing and it just happens to be all of these things. What, a, what an interesting coincidence that all of these things just happen to be this way. And we go to another part of London, say Kensington, and it just happens to be that people are more likely to be private owners. And it just happens to be that um, it's a more expensive part of London. It happens to be that it's more likely to be funded centrally by our local government, um, by our, um, the government of, it's not the government of London, but like our central board of London and the UK um, bigger kind of government, but England's body, sorry, getting my, language mix up and it's just interesting that you happen to live here and you happen to have all of these things and resources and you happen to collectively look a certain kind of way and then we go to another part of London and you just happen to live here and you happen to look a particular kind of way collectively and you happen to have less resources isn't that really interesting and it's just all London right and I, I like to yeah when you kind of pull it through it just happens to be oh does it just really happen to be I think it really opens up um the conversation of like well why is it that if you're working class brown muslim you're gonna and you more likely might be in this part of town with less access to resources less funding less investment less um metrics in place to reduce air pollution and and this is the life experience that you have but then if you look if you're white, if you're from a middle income or upper class background, if you live in a private home, if you have access to, uh, to particular kind of wealth structures, you're more likely to have a better lived experience, you're more likely to have a local authority or council that are willing to invest in better air quality for you and your children. Hmm, 
what what stops our same local authority from providing the same access to treatment and service to these two different demographics? What could be the things that they would decide that one group deserves to have better treatment over another? Why would they not provide any equity of experience, right? And then we can think, and that's just London, <laughs> or that's just the UK. And we can think about, yeah. say, somewhere like Detroit and Flint with the water crisis. And it just happens to be that in Flint, Michigan, you just happen to have lots of lead in the water. That just happens to be predominantly African-Americans from working class backgrounds. That's really interesting. It just happens to be all of these indicators. Or you could talk about the Standing Rock crisis and no DPO. And it just happens to be that when this pipeline was trying to be rooted into a predominantly white and affluent community, they were successfully able to lobby against it. But when he went to First Nations people who also tried to lobby against it, yeah. that was rejected. Why is it that it's okay for First Nations people to have this pipeline drilling through their land and territories, but it's not okay for the white, wealthy, affluent residents of that same um, county? Mm. You know, and yeah. when you, and that's evident, that's fact. I know that you know all of these things, and, but maybe there's people listening who don't know these things, but these are factually true things that are currently taking place just in America and the UK alone. I hate them talked about other parts of the world. And when we kind of start mapping this out, we start looking at all of these, these, these coincidences, then we, at some point we have to acknowledge when does the coincidence end and when is this about structural design and when this is really about environmental racism, that if you happen to be of particular ethnicity or racial background and that might intersect with one's gender or class or again, geographical position, you are disproportionately gonna have a different life experience just by way of these social identity markers. Um, so I always just like to throw it out, isn't it interesting that these are all the things that happen to someone who looks a particular kind of way versus if you don't look like that? Why? I mean, why would that be the case? Um, and I think you mentioned a really good point just before we started recording about accepting where things are at without having to convince. And, mm. you know, there's so much research that's been done. There's so much evidence that's been gathered. Mm -hmm. Even the fact that some of this is accepted vocabulary within UNESCO, um, to me, tells me that I don't, I don't need to do any more convincing. If the United Nations mm. can accept that environmental racism is a thing, and that if you are a person of colour or an Indigenous or First Nation person, you are disproportionately going to have a different lived experience by virtue of um, one, how you've been racialized. I don't need to do any more convincing. <laughs> like, this is this is standard knowledge. And at some point we need to acknowledge willful ignorance and just straight out gaslighting and with the refusal to accept these very admittedly uncomfortable truths. I'm so glad you said that. Um, I really am because this is the last part of like, you're not trying to convince, you're just trying to do. And I think that's a mm. big piece because um, I loved how you explained essentially why environmental racism is a climate mm. issue, right? You wrote about mm. that, but you're really explaining those two things, not a coincidence, they're that's intimately mm. tied together, right? But you're right, we're gaslit then, right? We're gaslit into thinking it's an individual issue. Like if if we can just save up enough and move to a better place, right? Or if we can, just, you know, whatever the, what the, the fantasy mm. is. But there's an interesting thing when you just look around and instead of, what Tony, Mor Tony Morrison say like the 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 point of racism is to basically make you continue yes. to prove it's so funny I was just about right? to say <laughs> it really you have to prove that yeah exactly yes right that, and right. so may she mm -hmm. rest as an ancestor right but it, it, mm -hmm. the same thing right it's like they it's when you accept the reality you're in and realize that the reality is trying to literally make you seem like you're the problem and you say I'm not going to convince you anymore I'm just going to be as you are doing for your work there's a, there's a big freedom in that, right? But, but also there's a big responsibility because now it's like, it's there. We have a problem. Now, what do we do, right? Mm. So the, the acceptance of the reality versus trying to prove that it exists, yeah. I, right, is really one of the ways I see us starting to combat the fear mongering that whiteness and racism makes us, mm. right? Like, so, and for a lot of the work you're doing really gets to this idea of, I'm not convincing it is, so now what do we do, right? And that's why I love talking with you. This next part is what can we do when you have this concept called ecologies of care that you've talked, that you've written about and spoken on, and then also um, more about ethics of care, and then mm. what does it mean for different ecologies? like institutions is when ecology mm -hmm. start to like do this kind of praxis uh, idea of what it means to really care for us when we accept the fact that 
shit's real, right? Mm -hmm. Climate change is here. It's, it's always been here. And now we're in the midst of it and we're impacted. Can you explain um, for all of us, if when we accept this reality and thinking about one way we can really start to construct a future where we're actually here and, and surviving mm -hmm. and thriving and not just kind of going at it, how does one think about an ecology of care? What is it? How do we think about it? And how do we do it if we don't necessarily have a great template? In front of mm. you, right that's yeah I mean that's really I'm gonna I'm gonna get to this but I feel like I want to reference a few things that situate around this just Perfect. to get to like the pinpoint so yeah I really appreciate you referencing the Teddy Morrison quote because I was literally about to say the same <laughs> thing I was gonna say this is great quote by Teddy Morrison where you know they say you're, you're unintelligent you do all this time researching mm -hmm. and another quote by Teddy Morrison that really always sits with me is racism is a distraction and it's designed to keep you away from your purpose yes. and I kind of see the accepting of this is what the um status quo is this is what our reality is is not to be distracted and not to get caught up in this other conversation to try and prove that this thing exists and this evidence is true and it's you know been paired reviewed and all these other things like if you don't want to accept that that's on you and your terms but I know what what is taking place there and what this is and that's the distraction that I, I personally don't want to get into. And I hope collectively that we shouldn't be getting into that. Our purpose is liberation. Our purpose is um, not just liberation for people, but liberation for all um, you know, beings or whatever um, life form that might take. And so when we get distracted into these proving our truths and proving our realities, we are, you know, I would say wasting our time trying to convince our oppressor not to be oppressors anymore. And um, I don't think hey we're not interested <laughs> in that conversation or interested in that course of actions of like negotiating. Like I want to get the work of liberation done and that work takes many different forms depending on what we feel we can contribute. And for me, my contribution is writing and researching. And that can take different forms from someone else. It might be, you know, community organizing or, you know, whatever that the contribution they see that they can best offer, right? Um, so how does that connect to ecologies of care? I think it's all of those things. Um, I wrote that at the height of the BLM um, global BLM protest, of course, centered in response to what was taking place in the US. And remember, um, being really impacted by COVID and seeing like the death of black people um, and the anti-blackness isn't any different to the anti-blackness of the death of black people um, predominantly both in the UK and the US due to COVID. Like these exactly the same infrastructures, there's yeah. nothing um, disconnected about them. It's just white supremacy um, and thinking about the climate in the same way that again, if you, you know, people of color are disproportionately you know affected by this again it's the same infrastructure of white supremacy so I remember thinking about the ecologies of care of being how does white supremacy and therefore race and racism translate into these different systems that are in a way quite violent but also um the necropolitics of it you know the, the ways of which it's designed to kill us um mm. how does that impact our sense of survival but also thriving and living and I want when I was writing about ecologies of care it was about how do I thrive and survive and how what are the things that I need to water me you know what are the conditions that I need to have the best possible lived experience that I can and other people collectively can have and how do we see them as intersecting um systems that systems of domination but also how do we move beyond systems of domination because um i believe that part of the kind of like radical black imagination and radical black tradition is thinking beyond these things is thinking beyond the scope of this and i'm very kind of influenced by like tony morrison's writing and octavius butler's writing of speculative fiction mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and how do we speculate because i also feel like part of activist work is speculating our future and is speculating our lives beyond these systems because if we don't then we accept that these systems are true and that our lives are fixed and are designed and um emboldened to them and they're not like my life is not emboldened to white supremacy um sure. So 
if I can if I can say that and think that my, I can have a life that exists beyond this um so can everybody else um so can all life forms and I want to speculate and and radically imagine what that life would be like and I, I think just even saying that and thinking that is quite a radical thing to do um because these systems make us believe that our lives are forever dictated and informed by them and mm -hmm. well quite frankly they're not so there's something I've got so much in my head right now because when we think about yes, I was going to say yes because this idea of dreaming, right, or this idea of the mm -hmm. speculation, right, as when we think about if we accept what we're in and we realize that it's not the only reality we're in, mm -hmm. right, right. It's so I love what you're saying in this speculation. Something in my own work I've been thinking a lot about is liberation, right? And I'm glad you touched on this as you're saying like in the liberation work, there's everyone has different, there's different functions one can have mm -hmm. right, one way. And you're saying for you, it's like you know you can do writing and research. Other folks mm -hmm. are organizing, and that's something mm -hmm. we see a lot with youth where they think they have to do all of it, right? Yes, so, exactly. You know, mm -hmm. So the activism is framed in this idea and you're doing it all, and but it becomes mm -hmm. another mechanism of a capitalistic way, right, of, of mm. trying to create space, right? So when you're talking about liberation, you're understanding where you are, something that kept coming up to me, especially thinking about how the state tries to kill us all the time, mm -hmm. so deception, is the one thing they've taken away from us so that we don't know how to speculate or what I call dreaming is they took mm -hmm. away our ability to rest, right? Yeah. So they can rest away, they've taken, they've taken downtime, they've made us mm -hmm. to be filled as like productive and lazy. And so we got to always keep doing. And we think about us as these kind of, creations of these capitalist kind of labor force right, bodies, right? Mm -hmm. And then we think about how then that's also translate to how we see our environment and see our land and see how we got to keep taking and taking. Where do you see then, and you've written about this before in other places, where do you see rest, right? Where do you mm -hmm. see coming to self? Where do you see coming inward? Um, as part of this work so that we mm -hmm. understand that it's not about the doing for us and we've done so much. It's really mm -hmm. about the dreaming and the being, right, as part of that care. So can you mm. talk about, because that's what the first thing I thought about when you're saying, I'm like, yes. And then the first thing they robbed us of was our ability to actually yeah. rest, right? Mm. So yeah, so let's talk about that. Yeah, I always think about a few things about our ability to dream and our ability to liberate. And I feel like if I'm of Caribbean um, descent, and I'm going to presume that you're African-American, like, mm. Of, mm. so, we have ancestors who were enslaved, yet they still mm -hmm. had the ability to dream. Now, I don't know if I could ever exist under the plantation society. I don't know about you, but I know it's no. <laughs> right. But they did. And yet they existed yes. under the most harshest conditions possible ever known to human beings. Yeah. And yet still had the ability to love yes. and to form companionship mm -hmm. and community and family and to dream. Like imagine being under the most harshest systems ever and you still have the capacity to still exist in your humanity. Like I know that I couldn't. <laughs> like, I really put my hand up that I couldn't do that. <laughs> but they were able to, <laughs> which yes. means they're made of something different than what I am not made of, right? Yes. And I mean, if my ancestors under bondage could love, could commune, could gather, could sing, could dance, could keep culture, keep language, keep spirituality. Mm. Then, and I guess I am, I am under sister of bondage, or we could talk about a plantation society still being around, but not that. Yes. But I'm willing to accept these are much more harsher conditions than what I'm currently under, which means I have no excuse but to. If they can do it, I have no excuse but mm. to. And I feel like it's also my duty to. Um, if they were able to do it in those conditions, it's my duty to be able to do it under these conditions. Um, so that's one way, one way why I think that's really important. And I think the other thing about rest and care and the kind of the connection between those two things is that rest is really important. Um, there's, I think about like Trisha Hershey's work, that um, mm -hmm. ministries. Yes. Um, that. I mean I've been able to speak to her and she's been inspiring but like just the importance of the fact that taking that time out to rest to pause to sit yeah. in our stillness um is disruptive to capitalism is disrupting to this kind of constant doing that we are told to do especially if you're black or other racialized folks where we are constantly framed as lazy and aren't you know 
hard hard work you know like all of these kind of very vicious mm-hmm. stereotypes that are labeled against our identities and our bodies and the the need for us to dispel against it to again getting distracted to be to be proving ourselves yes. to be worthy when we know that we work hard already that we're already giving more plus anything else so I think to even like existing mediocrity is quite important like to to not to prove one's excellence or yeah. to prove one's um over capabilities because I think in a way that could be an internalization of our own like racialized dehumanization yes. to constantly prove ourselves yes. um, and I think you know saying no is really important taking time out and also taking the time you need to respond there is such an assumption that you have to respond to things straight away and sometimes you can and sometimes you can't and both of those things are okay but again this kind of acceleration of capitalism makes us believe oh my gosh this emails come now and I have to respond to it now or this text message has come now like no <laughs> like you can afford ourselves the time to respond when we need to respond um and I think that's really important to like learn our own rhythms and partly so now my brain's just like so you know this idea that we all have a circadian rhythm it's our own natural rhythms of our bodies but under capitalism it's been reshifted yes. to work in according to eight hour days and sun up and sun down right so it's been abused it's been distorted it's been violated mm-hmm. and I think it's really important that we are able to get in contact with our own circadian rhythms so we get to one exist and learn our bodies better like you know as material physical entities but also as metaphorical spiritual entities too and again capitalism is also designed to disembody us so that we don't exist in our bodies and we don't know it but also we don't think about our bodies as a metaphysical experience mm. and I think that for me rest is about all those things it's about knowing when you've reached no it's not knowing when you reach your limit knowing when you're about to reach your limit so you don't reach your limit you know, we should never be reaching our limit. <laughs> you know, we should never really get to the point of exert- overexertion or being burnt out or being worn down. Um, and I think those are really important, I think, individual or interpersonal practices that we can do. And collectively, I think there's something about how do we, I guess, people who is interested in liberatory work or activism work or social justice work, how, like, how do we build in these ideas of like, we, you know, give ourselves time and rest to debrief, give ourselves time to talk about our emotionality, you know, have have these check-ins as part of our work. You know, I think these are really important practices about care, about, you know, we're we're showing people that we're seeing all of you, not just what your ideas or what your physical body can do or move, but the overall well-being of us. Um, So yeah, I think that's really, really important work. And now I'm gonna reference um, Bell Hooks, I think, if I had this conversation without referencing Bell Hooks, not because she's dead, because I always reference Bell Hooks. Um, I think, you know, Bell Hooks has a whole like set of like um, books around kind of love and yes. um, care and, yeah. and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So the first, um, so there's a treat, the trio is Sisters of the Yam, all about love, salvation and black people of love. So of that, trio I first read Sisters of the Am and I remember um I just remember it just this was like in 2015 mm. so this is six years ago damn um I just remember just you know you read something I just get to put it down and I was and I just and I felt like she was mm-hmm. reading me like for Phil <laughs> but like she was directly talking to me and just like dragging me yes through a whole book <laughs> <laughs> the whole like the whole time I thought it was dried, like my hairlines, everything snatched off. <laughs> and and I just remember just like, yes, I just remember having this this physical moment of reading and just having to put down and pause and be like, I need to come back to this tomorrow or I need to sit with this page or sentence. Cause it just constantly in the most positive way confronting me with the ways in which as a black femme I am socialized to show up in a particular kind of way I'm socialized to do these things but also how people are socialized to expect these things from me at the same time so reading that explicitly in words was like not just life-affirming and overwhelming but again it was part of the developing of my critical consciousness and Jeremy Bell Hooks has been part of developing my critical consciousness in a number of ways just from black feminism from this all her writing about care and love but also pedagogy and teaching as well um so she sits across my life in these very kind of intersecting and blurred areas 
and I'm very thankful and I'm glad I hope she's transitioned to where she needs to be with our ancestors because she has done important work for so many of us across the world. Um, I feel like I'm going to cry. Sorry, I'm just going to... No, it's okay. No, it's, it's a great just, remembrence, right? Remembrance. Yeah, people. like, you I just... call the ancestors. Yeah, in, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be who I was without Bell Hooks. Yes. Um, and so a lot of her work um, inspires a lot of the work that I do about care, about love, about ecologies. Now, I've always like, oh, but what's ever wrote about environmentalism? But I know she would have had something to say. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure she probably has something to say <laughs> um, still. And yeah, I guess this particular individual and the impact of her work has shifted my thinking in relation to all the stuff that we're talking about today as well. So some of these ideas you know, I have to cite Bell Hooks in this conversation because yes. I wouldn't have come to these conclusions without reading you know, her and her, you know, been able to set me on a pathway to think about things in slightly different ways. So I think it's important just to pay my celebration and homage to the impact of her life and her work on me and my own writing and research. Yeah, but this is great because you're also expressed and you're giving us an intimate um, um, example, right, for everybody who's listening or watching this in the future of what it means to actually embody this ethics mm-hmm. of care, right? Because what you're able to do in this this moment, which is so beautiful, is honor somebody who has passed, but mm-hmm. knowing and sowing, speaking of how that remembrance, that spiritual aspect, because you talked about how it's not just the material, it's a spiritual, right? It's mm-hmm. about this whole ethics of care and rest mm-hmm. and integration. We have to remember who we came from, who built upon, who we, who our ancestors were, right? But not just remember it, but speak their names, mm-hmm. actually understand what they brought so that we can bring that energy back into our space, right? Mm-hmm. And that's something, you, we talk about this a lot throughout this, that what you were saying, but also the writings is, that's the one thing that colonization really did to us, is it separated us on mm-hmm. purpose, right? From our intimate relationship with not just ourselves, with our, our past, our people, mm-hmm. but also our land, right? Because our ancestors, from yep. the land they come, they return all this stuff. So it makes sense to bring in someone like a bell hooks, may she rest, right? And transition because it's it's the embodiment of what it means mm-hmm. to literally live a praxis of care, but also know that just because you live a praxis of care does not mean it's going to be accepted in a society yep. that is only knows how to extrapolate, mm-hmm. right? So I think that's really important. So you're also showing that it takes some bravery and guts to just do and be and do you in a, in a place that's telling us to conform, right? Mm-hmm. And the one thing, and I, what Belle did, and a lot of other, I think a lot of Black feminists and also Indigenous folks have done for a lot of us is show us that we are, we can only be human or we can only be alive with a body, right? Yeah. We can only be alive. And you talked about the body a lot. And something I'm talking a lot, I talk a lot about with, with a lot, of, especially um, Brown and Black women and femmes in academia, but also in society mm-hmm. in general is we are told to remove ourselves from our emotions, right? We were told that any kind of feeling we have that is not just plain, if you're a black woman, especially any anger, if you are not just plain mm-hmm. looking or, or amenable, right? Then somehow you you can't work. So then we're told mm-hmm. to separate ourselves, right? Well, what, what I call our emotional technology, we're told that mm-hmm. we are not how we feel, but our feelings and how we feel in our body is the actual power we have to be able to understand our limits, how to care for ourselves one another, right? So there's a way that, Coming back to what I'm hearing you say and how I'm thinking about my own work is I tell people all the time, like, until you can feel your rage, until you can feel your anger, until you can feel your grief and actually ask it what it's trying to show you, you can never find true liberation because then that's what allows us and that's what's attaching us from our actual source, our actual sense of self, to be able to know how we then work with other people and create these communities, right, that we want to be able to do. So we got to feel. Mm. But how do we feel when we have been told our whole lives that to feel, right, is not successful? To feel and express, right, Mm. is not going to allow you to be professional, right? And especially as Black folk, right? And especially as Black women and femmes or those who present as non hyper masculine, right? When we are told that the minute we step out of a line, then we will be shunned, right? So therefore, we have to bifurcate ourselves, Mm. right? How do we bring ourselves back whole so that we can enact this praxis of care, which then allows us to connect back to ourselves, our communities, our ancestors, and our land to then know how we actually sit in harmony, right? Mm. That's a big thing. But Janine, how do you think about that, right? How do you think about yeah, that? Yeah, I think and all that stuff, right? <laughs> I started smiling partly <laughs> because I've thought about a very direct experience that happened today mm. um, on a Teams call, my work Teams call. So it was me and my colleagues um, had this training 
thing, my jig, whatever. And we had this like the facilitators, oh, let's just go around and that's how everybody's feeling. So, you know, I'm overwhelmed or I'm tired. And I was like, I'm really sad. And I was crying because Bell Hooks died last night. And like, everybody looked at me like, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to say it. I was crying yeah. and I'm sad because I've been reading this person. And as I shared this in the meeting, I've been reading her since um, I was 18. I'm 34. That's nearly half my life. And um, I'm really sad. And I think it just, the room went really quiet. And I'm like, no, I'm going to hold space for that because black women and black femmes we get sad and we cry you know <laughs> like these are feelings that we have you may not think we experience these things or we have these feelings oh but they're very real <laughs> and so when I said I'm really sorry the person who's texting me was and I don't think this is by coincidence the white trans person was my colleague who texted uh, me and said just checking in on you because you said you're feeling sad today are you um just sending you some love and I don't think of all the people in that room it's not again it's such a coincidence it's the white trans person or the trans person in the room that texts me mm-hmm. the other non-binary genderqueer person what a coincidence you know um so again I think it's about who how who sees us for me and that was about yeah. who sees me yes I'm a black femme and non-binary and genderqueer but the person who saw me yes they're white also experiences a marginalization in that space or also experience mm-hmm. a dehumanization and they saw me another person slightly different in in how we sh- experience things but someone that they s- see themselves in right yes there was a white cis het colleague who said oh my gosh I can't believe that Bill Hooks died brought up Sisters of the Yam <laughs> right I'm not even lying to you I was like I really love this book <laughs> <That fan. laughs> I'm not even lying to you she brought this book out and said I really love this book by her Bell Hooks and you have a black femme in the room that says I'm feeling really sad at Bell Hooks died and there's no connection with the book that you just held called Sisters of the Am the black femme in the room saying I'm really sad and no like Janine are you okay yeah right um so again all this kind of performativity of of things but um so I think the emotionality and speaking our emotions again I think is so important because I, we are socialized into a very white yeah. middle class professionality that says these things aren't part of quote unquote the workplace environment or that they should be hidden or siloed. And that if you are, if these things do enter into the workplace, only people with privilege and dominant identities are the ones that get to access this humanity. Because I think emotions and humanity for me are really intricately bounded that only humans get to be emotional or only humans get to have access to the full breadth of emotions so when we say that certain people if you talk about black women when we express our anger or are upset and we are stereotyped and or therefore dehumanized we're also saying that these people aren't human and they don't have access to the full scope of humanity um, and I think about someone like Sylvia Winter, who writes a lot about the conditions of human, conditions yes. of human um, humanity, and how that is, she calls it an ethnoclast, is a kind of reoccurring vocabulary in her writing, this ethnoclast, which describes as, you know, white supremacy, capitalism, patriarchy, coloniality, and that these are the, these are the systems that determine um, the ethnoclast of humanity. And if you sit outside of those frameworks, then, well, by virtue, you're not human, um, or you don't have access to humanity. And I think, yeah, we have to really open up the conversation of quote unquote the human and its connections to um, oh, my brain just went blank to eugenicism as well, yeah. actually, and emotions and all of these things. Because when we talk about emotionality, it also falls into very patriarchal and colonial discourse that if you express emotions, you don't have rationality, you are subjective, you know, you fall into these very kind of um, binaries as such. So I think, yeah, there's so much with emotions that it's not a neutral term um, when it's applied or who has access to show it. And that if you are someone whose identities fall outside of like dominant ones, you're, you're automatically seen as inferior, and, I, and that's why a lot of people think shut down or a lot of people are scared to show their emotions because yes. of the lack of reaction or the lack of care, but also how they feel that they might be perceived. And I think these are such understandable, in, in many cases, logical responses, because it's about 
your materiality and your survival. But I think it also, I think it hurts me when I hear people say this or see it because you're denying yourself the yes. ability to experience this. And I think the one thing that we can give ourselves is not to deny ourselves our ability to experience things or to live in our bodies or, to, you know, to be in our feelings. Like that's very mm -hmm. real. We, are, we can be in our feelings about things and we can express being our feelings about this and if you can't handle it, then that's a you problem. That's nothing to do with me about how I feel in the world. So, yeah. No, I'm glad you brought that. I'm glad you brought Winter's work up too, right? Because I'm a big fan of Winter's work Same. about, right? The human and who is the human and how it got so narrowed down. But it makes a lot mm. of sense in the context of this because if we're not allowed to feel, right? And then we're told that to feel means that somehow we cannot fully be, but to fully be means you cannot feel, then there's something going mm. on, right? Something so so there's there's like what we call this kind of what the, what Fanon calls this kind of crazy making, right? This kind of like you're constantly like trying to figure out where you are and how and what place you're in. And as you were talking, something I, kept, I think about a lot, I think about a lot, a lot, right, is do we throw away the content of the human? Do we, do we interrogate it more? Do we take it back, yeah. right? right? And so in winter, it plays with this a lot, right? Afro-pessimists play it different ways. And winter mm. really gets into it in, yes. I think, a really great nuanced way to help us say, like, really, no, what problem was really is in order for somebody to not just dehumanize, but also destroy other living things, right? They got to narrow who the hell is actually a human, right? Also, you're dehumanized too. <laughs> and this right? is what Paolo Ferrer says, that yes. oppression doesn't just dehumanize, oppression doesn't oppress the oppressors. Oppression, oh, you know what I'm trying to say. Ah, yes. Oppression, oppression yes. doesn't just oppress the oppressed, it also oppresses the oppressor. Right, and even more Slightly, so, right? Even more so, exactly. Yes, because you have Where, to. You have to, in order for you to oppress someone, it means you can't also be human too. Yes. Yes, right? So then we got a problem with the human, right? So how can we have a life if we are so messed up, we don't even know what the hell human is anymore. We're thinking mm. human means exactly what you just said, right, Janine? I love how you broke it down. It's rational, it's subjective, it's not emotional. But all we see in front of us every day, think about every day in the UK and US particularly, we can just talk about the UK and US alone. All we see is nothing but white male aggression and anger. Mm. But all we see are emotions that are unregulated as somehow the norm, right? But they're okay to have those because no one knows actually how to handle the damn emotions anymore because we have been so removed from who we are in order to take into a to hierarchy mm. place, right? Who the hell then are we? And I think this is what's really coming out now when the example you gave of the only the one person who can actually see you in that moment and your, your need of care was another person that was marginalized. And it makes me think a lot of, can we only find real humanity at the margins? Mm -hmm. Because it's only at the margins that we are allowed to actually quote unquote be because we are not seen, mm -hmm. right? So it's kind of the slippage in and out. And it's not to romanticize, it's not to say it's not hard, but it's kind of to think about what does it mean again going out to care and environment and and you know access to resources and races all this stuff what does it mean then for us to come back to ourselves to back to our own humanity so that we can actually then come back into a community again mm. for that care to come right so how do you think I, about that? yeah i think the margins is probably the most powerful is where the real work takes place mm. and where the real conversations are happening, where the real kind of transformatory practice are taking place. I think the margins is such um, a powerful place, you know, outside of the institution, yes. um, you know, outside of these kind of socially engineered places. And a friend of mine, or I hope he doesn't mind me calling him a friend, he's called <laughs> um, Jack, Jack Tan, or someone that I've been in conversation with a lot. And we was talking about institutions, like, Jack, I really hate institutions, blah, blah, blah. And he was like, actually, you, you hate institutions in their current format or how we currently mm. know them as. And he said, mm. I wanna, he gave me a position. It was like, you know, I want you to think about that human beings constantly institute behavior all the time, that we constantly learn things. Yeah. And then we learn, okay, this works. This is a good thing. Let's keep doing this thing because it, it serves a purpose. It serves a function and, and you know, it, it generates results. He goes, but what we're upset with or what we don't like is the, the exploitation or the you know yes. domination or the harm of these instituting behaviors but I, I just appreciate what he said actually I don't he's like this and then he said the distance between institution and instituting behaviors and um Ooh. yeah I really yeah I really sat with like 
what oh. we are talking about is instituting not institutions and oh. um these are two very separate like they do coincide but they're two very separate things mm-hmm. i'm also probably not saying it as sophisticated as jack said it but anywho um yeah that just really sat with me about i'm interested in instituting radical behaviors or instituting yeah. practice and instituting you know models of care i'm not interested in institutions of these things or how institutions can be better because i think they are what they are and that's okay and, and i'm sure there's individuals in institutions who on an interpersonal level want to see a radical shift and want you know but as a collective model as a system of practice they are designed to be what they are and the only way that they can be undesigned is that I do believe they have to be toppled you know they have to come down they have to be you know decolonized and Fernand you know talks about decolonization is you know the last coming he takes his biblical um verse last coming first and the first coming last and I think there's something about yeah you know decolonizing institutions isn't just putting in better practices and having more representation of um, underrepresented groups. It's actually a whole denaturing, a whole deguttering of Mm. everything that takes place. And I think it means bringing down of these things and starting again and starting afresh. Um, And I think it's also about, again, Jack was, you know, and I was talking about that. We've always had institutions. Like, do you mean we've always had libraries? We've always had places of education. We've always had models of gathering people, models of theatre, because this is part of what humans do. It's just, we don't like the the iterations (laughs) that exist. It's like, you know, the ideas of a library or the ideas of a university or a place of education are actually fundamentally really important things for human human life, human self-esteem, human, you know, just, preservation and, and being generative it's just we don't like the white supremacist versions of it we don't like the patriarchal versions of it and so what's been helping with my thinking is that yeah instituting behaviors or instituting models of care or instituting places of education doesn't have to be in the current forms that we know that we can re- radically reimagine new ways of doing this or caring ways or um ways that yeah don't take on board or then absorbing the models of oppression and the oppressor. And, and yeah. yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. And, and, I, and, we're, we're, and we're kind of seeing that, if you think about it, when you're talking mm. to me and I'm like, wow, we really are kind of starting to see this kind of movement mm. of folks coming back to these kind of sense, right? This again, mm. remembering, right? Remembering of where we, long time ago have been in order to see where we could be right when we see this in the U.S. the kind of what we call the mass resignation right and and people realizing like they actually have more agency as a collective power right because they are the backbone right Mm -hmm. so we're starting to see people realize that they have more stake in the game than they were told they actually do but not just Mm -hmm. more more power right more power in it and so we're seeing power when I'm hearing you talking and this remembering and all these things it's like it's like two different types of power so institutionalized mm. institution is like how do we what how do we engage with the power we have one is oppressive like you say and it's like no no mm. one like it because <laughs> it ain't working for none of us <laughs> right so now people are like oh wait a minute what's the other type of power we can harness yeah. like you're saying through a different kind of care ethic and, and as you were mm. talking i'm like wow we're trying to figure it out now like in different ways mm. we're doing it through labor of coming together for betterment of people before, after us right mm. But then at the same time, we're here in this moment where we also have this constant inundation of like, there's COVID coming in, there's new variants mm-hmm. coming in, there's lockdowns coming in, right? There's there's others in the US, we've got the whole political overtaking of the government thing that <laughs> still hasn't been addressed almost a year later, right? <laughs> so uh, so when we have, so what I'm saying is as we're having these ideas and pockets of hope, we also constantly have the chaos, right? That's turning around us and it's always gonna be there. As we kind of wrap this up, Janine, not just, not, I hate this idea of an idea of hope, but how do we have people understand that when the chaos is theirs, it's always gonna be there. How do we have, how, do, how would you help people see that there's still a different future possible because the chaos will mm-hmm. always be there? Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I think even radical decolonial work is a chaos. Again, Fanon talks yeah. about this in Wretched of um in Concerning Violence. He talks about decolonization being a chaotic project. Ah. And the undoing. Talk about, chaos, yeah. so talk about how chaos means chaos. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up. So let's talk about how chaos means chaos then. <laughs> and I'm only saying this because I was reading Fanon very recently with my students, <laughs> reading that chapter. And, then, and you know when you reread something, you're like, oh, yes. that sounds up to me. Yes. And so yeah, so I do want to throw that into the room that Fanon tells us in that first chapter, decolonization, I'm not um, quoting directly, but paraphrasing, mm-hmm. is a chaotic practice because yes. we're undoing, you know, systems of order of how we have known them to be and assume how natural they are when we actually know they're very unnatural. So it is, we're always, whether we're in a chaos of white supremacy or patriarchy mm-hmm. or capitalism or cis heteronormativity or whether we're in a chaos of trying to do those, undo those systems of domination, whatever point, yes, they're different chaoses, but we're always gonna be in a chaos of some kind. So I think it's important for us to know that when we are undoing these systems, they are chaotic approaches, they are chaotic practices by its very nature, because we are creating chaos, we're creating, you know, rhythm, we're creating, we're, un, we're literally shaking, that is a chaotic thing. Um, so, and I think, and I think there's something quite special about chaos because, it's still, when you think you know what you're doing, actually takes away the space to, to exist, right? So if something is chaotic, it means you don't know what's gonna come at you and you have to be a bit more ready and a bit more agile and a bit more open to how things move forward. If you think that I'm doing um, systems of power and domination is a very stable, linear or organized process, then you're in for a huge downfall because it's not as chaotic. So I think there's something quite, powerful about the chaotic in how it makes us agile and responsive and also thinking about the future but also responding to what's happening in the in the here and now um, and I think about you know areas of thought that I'm starting to get into or wanting to learn more about um, is the idea of abolitionism as you know, a really interesting process of you know creating chaos to justice and how justice is currently organized as um, yeah, enacting all kinds of violence against different marginalized people. So, and the idea that we don't need policing to ab- abolish policing, to abolish prisons, to abolish these supposed forms of, again, institutions that we were told keep us in check, that keeps law and order, keeps people from doing bad things when we know that we have, like, it's a state violence <laughs> exists. Yeah. Make that makes sense. Um, and so I, I find like the writings of abolitionism really interesting as a way to think about their chaos. And I think there's something also about returning, you mentioned before, returning back to those who have come before us, who were, Fanon is someone that I hugely love, who were writing at particular points in time in the 60s and 50s, who were going through the chaos of decolonization or witnessing yeah. the chaos of decolonization and how um, important it is to read their work um, around what, they were imagining what the the places of origins could be, um, and I actually really love um, Richard of the Earth because I think it is a place of hope. It's a book of hope. It's someone literally witnessing, mm-hmm. um, you know, armed struggle <laughs> mm-hmm. in in the in in his hair and now, um, and the impact of that and the chaos of that because. It was chaotic. I can imagine that what stuff. Yeah. It seems really chaotic, actually. So I think there's the importance of like returning to work who or people who've written in that time of these the chaos of trying to overturn um, systems of power and systems of domination. And then the last thing is that power. So I'm always interested that power isn't actually a bad thing. What we're used to is the abuse of power. Yeah. We're used to the abuse of power, again, if it's capitalism, patriarchy, okay. white supremacy, whatever. And that we all hold power, actually, in different ways. Yes. Um, and we're told that we're not, because that's how dominant, domination is meant to exist. If we knew that we held power, then domination couldn't do its job very well. Yes. And so the whole purpose of domination is to make us believe that we're powerless, but actually we're, we're powerful and just in different ways. Um, and I think that then also opens up this idea of scarcity and abundance if you feel like you're powerless it means that you feel like you you exist in scarcity now this isn't to deny that actual material scarcity exists for oppressed people of course on both uh, everyday lived level and the structural systemic level but conceptually I also think that people I know from my lived experience of going to particular parts of the Caribbean when I see people with the least also has the most in terms of like spiritual power or or soul power or social power or like thinking power you know yes 
And I think there's something interesting about how we think about these different modes of power that we have access to, even if we might have a marginalized identity or background. And what are, and why are we often told mm. something like spiritual power is inferior? Why is spiritual power? It's not. It's not. Like to be able to wake up every day mm -hmm. and keep going on and to have that, you know, a sense of joy or hope about you is hugely powerful. Yes. And this goes right back to where you started mm. off with Janine, right? Like this is a beautiful circle moment where you talk about the scarcity and you, when you started mm. off talking about how we are, we think that it, time is scarce, everything is scarce, mm. right? And so to, to start off by having us think about what, how, we're, how we are told that there is no hope unless we do it one way, right? Mm. And that's the scarcity and the timing and the fear mongering, which you really, really tell us understand that this is wrapped up in white supremacy, racism, and how that is a time mm. thing, past and present tied to climate, right? And when now we come to the end and it's like, yes, but if we realize and we accept it for what it is, <laughs> that it's a distraction, mm. <laughs> that it's made for us to, to keep domination. And I love how you keep saying that we just, we don't, we don't like oppressive power, but all we know is abuse of oppressive power. Mm. And we realize it's more than that. And then we realize that scarcity is actually nothing more than a power move. We all have power ourselves, mm -hmm. right? It's a great way to end to realize that even though environmental racism and climate change are heavily tied, we have power to start to think about what is a different way forward if we look at the past, right? In a, mm -hmm. that time, in a much more different and much more realistic, a holistic way that mm -hmm. lets us know that we have power, right? Individually and collectively mm -hmm. to start to shift and move in these kind of care ways. Um, hope that's a great way I, I summed up what you see, yeah. you're saying. Okay, I hope that accurately portrays it. But um, we're, at, we're at time, but I want to leave folks with how can they how can they work with you? How can they read you? How, read, read what you're talking about, Janine? Like, how can they follow your work or support you? Because the work you're doing and how you're framing it is so vitally important, right? Not just for environmental work, but for liberation work in general, right? Which is tied to, to environment, climate, land, ancestors, right? And self. So, yeah. How to find me? How to find me? Um, if you are on Twitter or on Instagram, you can follow me via my handle, which is at it's Janine BTW. So it's Janine, by the way. Or you can, I blog quite regularly, or I try to blog regularly, should I say. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> Not always possible. Um, of my website of the same name, which is it's Janine BTW.com. And you'll see um, writings that's been referenced today by Nicole. Um, I published all of my writing on on my blog or links to where it's been published so yeah my website is a really good place to find my social media handles and then any of my written work or research okay perfect and then what we'll do is i'll make sure that in the the show notes that we'll have mm -hmm. um, also links for you as well for your twitter handle and yeah. your um and your website which is great that's how i found most of your work anyway um for the website and then before we leave janine any last things you want to say that you're just like burning or you just want to make sure that we that we take home with us as we end this mm -hmm. combo yeah, I just want to think about it's so important that in this time and age with some of our elders like Bell Hooks leaving us to transcend into a new um oh, we just broke. I think I froze again, right? You just froze, yeah. You sorry. Said yes. <laughs> <It's okay>. <laughs> <laughs> I just I'll start my sentence again. So yeah. I guess my part departing or last comments will be. Um, yeah, Bell Hooks' passing has put things in perspective in terms of our elders who are with us as not as long as we like them to be. I would, I mean, saying six to nine is no age to pass, but it is what it is or what it needs to be. So cherish them, talk to them, and I don't and I don't mean the quote unquote famous one. I mean us in our own family. You know, yeah. speak to your elders, record their stories. Um, my aunt passed earlier and I only, I only recorded about an hour worth of her story and I wish I got more, but don't wait to those moments because recording their stories is knowledge sharing and it helps us continue their existences and what they do and what they know. And just to really think about radical love, Bell Hooks has really given me to think about radical love as a source of power and a way of organizing for liberatory practice and activism. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you, Janine. And that's a great message. And um, I wish you all the best. And may the ancestors continue to watch over you and um, you know, all of us, right? And may Belle um, also rest as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I'm gonna...